Good morning, and welcome to All Saints Sunday. Welcome to the Episcopal Church of the Good Shepherd. We are so glad you are with us. All you'll need for our worship service today is the order of service leaflet found in the link below or in the comments section on Facebook. If you are new or visiting us, we want to extend a special welcome to you and invite you to click on the Connect With Us link where you can share with us your contact information and we can be in touch with you shortly. We'd love to tell you more about Good Shepherd and invite you more fully into the life of our community. With that, let us offer to God and one another the fullness of our hearts as we begin our worship service together.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your Son, Christ our Lord. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. A reading from the Revelation to John. After this, I, John, looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the humble hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. 
I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me out of all my terror. Look upon him and be radiant, and let not, let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction, and the Lord heard me and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encompasses those who fear him, and he will deliver them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. Fear the Lord, you that are his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack nothing that is good. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see our God. The secret of the Lord is theirs, their soul is Christ's abode. The Lord who left the heavens our life and peace to bring to dwell in loneliness with us our pattern and our king he to the lowly soul will still himself impart and for his dwelling and his throne will choose the pure in heart. Lord, we thy presence seek. May ours this blessing be. Give us a pure and lowly heart, a temple. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, 
for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, awaken us this morning to the great mystery of the communion of saints, that we might run with courage the race that is set before us. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to All Saints Sunday. I love All Saints Sunday. I love it for the hope that it gives us. I love it for the sense of connection to the life around us. It is a blessing. All Saints Sunday celebrates this timeless moment, this thin moment when we become aware that the heavens and the earth are connected. It is a time when cultures around the world discern this thinness. In Mexico, there is the celebration of Dios de los Muertos. We have Halloween, a fun and scary way to think about things coming up from the grave back into our awareness. In our theology, we talk about the communion of saints, and we honor this in the sacrament of the Eucharist. We believe that in this eternal nature of the sacrament, that anyone who ever has taken communion or anyone who ever will, it will is present in this sacramental moment. All Saints Sunday reminds us of this wide mystery of the communion of saints, and that is what I would like to talk about this morning. How many of us have ever wondered if our grandmother or our father or our spouse is reaching out to us through a particular experience from the heavens into our earthly reality? And we wonder, was that just a coincidence or was someone trying to tell us something? What was it about that experience that made you think about this thinness and the heavens being much closer than we think they are? Last year, just before All Saints Sunday, I had one of those moments. I received a card from my grandmother in the mail, and normally that would be a, a normal thing to receive, except that she had died four years before. My mother and father were moving into a retirement community, and my mother found this card that was never sent and put it into the mail. And so I opened this card for my grandmother four years after she had passed away and was so grateful to hear her voice through her words. That experience was followed up two days later when I was sitting in my office talking to a deacon in our parish, and she was so kind, she brought me this gift. It was a chalice from a home communion set that she had had in her family since the 1850s. And she presented it to me, and she said, there's a card inside of it telling you about its age and, and the family that it came from. And so I opened up the card, and it turned out to be a chalice from a priest who had the same family name that I did, McVicker, from the same part of the country that my family was from. And I thought how strange it was to have these two experiences so close together, right on the heels of All Saints Sunday. It made me wonder 
how close those heavens are and what hope that brings to our hearts. In Scripture, in the letter to the Hebrews, it says, Therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run the race that is set before us. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us run that race that is set before us. In other words, let us be encouraged by those who have gone before and yet through this great mystery are still with us. Let us not be fatigued by the weight that we carry, but be encouraged by the presence of this great cloud of witnesses. What might this experience of this great cloud of witnesses look like? I heard a brilliant description from Father Mike Schmitz. He's a Roman Catholic priest and He tells this story to illustrate laying aside what holds us back and to encourage us by the great cloud of witnesses in each of our lives. And he talks about running an Ironman race in British Columbia. And now you all may be aware that to complete uh, complete an Ironman race, you must swim 2.4 miles, cycle 112 miles, and then, after that, run an entire marathon. The competitors have a full day to complete that distance, but they have to finish by midnight or else they're listed as DNF, did not finish. It would be as if you never raced that distance at all. Competitors who finish go back to their hotels, usually early after they finish to shower and then come back to cheer the finalists as they come through the finish line. And Father Mike had finished his race and he showered and came back to the end point of of the finish line right about 10 o'clock at night to cheer those who were just crossing, completely exhausted by this heroic effort. And he could hear the announcer call each finisher by name. You know, what a moment, right? Just Uh, to to just really relish in all that they had put out. People cheering each one as they crossed that finish line. Starting about six miles out, the crowd gathers along the, the street lines and starts to build up to encourage the runners in this race. And within the last mile, the crowd is about three or four uh, levels deep. And for this particular race, The finish is you take a left-hand turn, and as you turn that corner, the competitor sees this great bleacher of people cheering them on. It had been a long day, and Father Mike said the race was coming to a close. It was about 11.45 at night, and then the race manager gets on the speaker, and he said, we just got word that there is a finisher who is two miles out. Now, it's 11.45. That's 15 minutes to go. He's two miles out. To finish the last two miles in 15 minutes would mean that you have to run an average pace of seven minutes and 30 seconds. Now, this is difficult to do for anyone, much less those who had just swam 2.4 miles, cycled 112 miles, and now we're just finishing a marathon. It just wasn't going to happen. Then the announcer says, let's bring him in. So people in the bleachers start filing out and began running down the course to cheer him on. And then the announcer got on the loudspeaker again seven minutes later and he said, we just got word that he's one mile out. One mile out. That meant he ran that that second to last mile in seven minutes. So more people get out and start to encourage him. They're filing out, they're running down the street to encourage this guy on. And time is ticking by and ticking by and you're wondering if this guy will ever make it. If it is after midnight, it will be as if he never ran that race. And at 11.59, Father Mike looks down the course and at that left-hand turn and he begins to hear this dull roar. And he looks down at that corner and he sees this guy sprinting as fast as he can, leaning in with everything he has. And behind him is a wall of people, an army, hundreds of people who had already run their race, but were running behind him to cheer him on. Now they couldn't run that race for him, but they were cheering him on as he was running his race. 
Everyone is watching the clock. Sounds of cheers from the crowd were deafening, and he crosses the finish line at 11.59 and 47 seconds. 13 seconds from not finishing at all. And everyone is hugging and crying. If you think about it, this runner never would have reached the finish line on his own, but without the encouragement of those who ran with him. He was able to do far more than he could even imagine. This is what I think the communion of saints are doing for us. They have already run their race of faith, but they are cheering us on, encouraging us in our weariness to do more than we could ever imagine we could do in ministry, lifting our spirits to press on, to keep on believing, to keep living Christ's commandments as if they are all that matters. They are trying to ensure us that we do not lose hope and that God may be glorified through our actions, that God may be glorified through our actions. As the letter to the Hebrew reads, Therefore, since we are, so, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. How can we not feel the hope of the heavens with us? I love this mystery, which is claimed on All Saints Sunday. I love it for how it encourages us in our hope and our faith. I love it for how it reopens us to this mystery of Christ with us, the gift of God with us, our humanity being lifted up, chosen to be vessels of grace to another. And so here we are. So here, here we are. How might we use this hope that is in us? How might we choose to live out this next moment? There are those in your life who took it upon themselves to give you the gift of faith. They took an interest in you and in your understanding of God and the wisdom of Scripture. It was in them that you saw an example of mature faith and it excited you. Who today is important for you to thank? Who among the communion of saints do you need to call out and honor for their sacrifice of time and how they gave themselves to you so that you would have this gift of faith to draw from. Dwayne Ring comes to mind for me. The man who opened the gift of scripture for me when I was in high school, without whom I would never be in ministry. Who has encouraged your faith? Speak their names. They are encouraging you as you run your race of faith. Who among the living has modeled hope and faithfulness to you? Who have made themselves incredibly available to you when you have needed them? Let us offer to God their names. Jim Hennessian for me, Mark Anschutz, Kathy Crow. Who might you also then encourage in their faith? Who might you give up of your time so generously as you have been generously given to? I want us to feel both the hope and the encouragement of the communion of saints and the need that is right now before us. We are the ones being asked to continue to plant those seeds of hope and to invest in the lives of those within and beyond our families. Now, I recognize there are limits during this time of a pandemic, but as we pray about our stewardship, this time of making a financial commitment through a pledge card, we are asked how much we are invested in this work of faith. And I want to tell you that the world's hope is that we are all in. Your homework is to spread hope and to find those in the wider community who need your encouragement. Please know that you are a model of faith to others. Let us make a difference and share our encouragement given to us by the communion of saints. And thanks be to God that we have been chosen for this incredible work of building up the faith in others. Amen.
dear people of God. In holy baptism, we have been made part of that great fellowship of believers in all times and places, the communion of saints. In baptism, God has adopted us as children and made us members of Christ's body and inheritors of God's kingdom with the saints in light. Let us, therefore, renew the vows of our baptism, by which God has made us a holy people. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will will come come again again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers? I will will, with God's God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. I I will will, with God's help. help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God and Christ? I I will will, with with God's God's help. help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I I will will, with with God's God's help. help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will will, with with God's God's help. May Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and bestowed upon us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in eternal life by his grace. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. United in the company of all the faithful and looking for the coming of the kingdom, let us offer our prayers to God, the source of all life and holiness. Merciful God, strengthen all Christian people by your Holy Spirit that we may live as a royal priesthood and a holy nation to the praise of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Bless Andy, Jeff, Kay, and Hector, our bishops, and all ministers of your church, that by faithful proclamation of your word we may be built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets into a holy temple in the Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our our prayer. prayer. Empower us by the gift of your holy and life giving spirit that we may be transformed into the likeness of Christ from glory to glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Give to the world and its peoples the peace that comes from above, that they may find Christ's way of freedom and life. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Hold in your embrace all who witness to your love in the service of the poor and needy, all who minister to the sick and dying, and all who bring light to those in darkness. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Touch and heal all those whose lives are scarred by sin or disfigured by pain, that, raised from death to life in Christ, their sorrow may be turned to eternal joy. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Remember in your mercy all those gone before us who have been well-pleasing to you from eternity. Preserve in your faith your servants on earth. 
Guide us to your kingdom and grant us your peace at all times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hasten the day when many will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at table in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the whole company of your saints in glory, with whom in fellowship we join our prayers and praise, especially those we remember this day. Catherine Umstad, Molly Davis, Dean Davis, Judy Bray, Nancy Merritt, George Moore, Anita Bynum, Rick Smith, Mike Andrews, John Kelly, Marge Kelly, Tinani Cooper, Francis Dummer Fisher, Valerie Dunham, Jenny Lind Porter, Peter Schramm, David Gracie, Walter Wilcox Cardwell III, Billy Page, Steve McNutt, Dorothy McNutt, Gordon McNutt Sr., Mary Beth Page, Harold Page, Judson Cowper Shepherd, Bob Tarleton, Howard Rose, Jeff Geeslin, Ben Geeslin, Alan Isaacson, George Williford, Nancy Pitzer, Paul William Pitzer, Paul William Pitzer III, Kent D. Dickerson, Henry Leander, Bill Banning, John Alexander, Woody Bartlett, Bob Miller, Lance Turner, Jerry Reese Reed, Todd Nielsen, Joe Powell, Carlos Klutz, John Cather Sargent, Evelyn Welton, Clarence Welton, Cather Sargent, Florence Sargent, Billy Bob Murphy, Tom Murphy, T. O. Murphy, Jr., T. Murphy, Joan Anderson, William Dockery, Jr., Henry Maupin Stewart, Marilyn Lionberger, Jenny Hurley Mandel, Sam Byron Holsey, Fran Dierker, Fred H. Dierker, Jr., Fred H. Dierker, Sr., Ann Dierker, Mary Louise Dierker Gorman, Bernard Gorman. Donna Ewell, Lydia DeMeyer, Anne Louise, 
Wayne Adams, Suzanne Lucas, Jim Gleitman, Ken Ross, Seal Scott, Wyla Labah, Ellen Schaff, Linda Gregg, Shana Price, William Fitzpatrick, Betty Bishop, Alan Irwin, Tim George, Marcia Braniff, Adriana Stockwell, David Leslie, Byram Christensen, Chuck Christensen, Dusty Gaston, Keen Ferguson, Janet Faulkner, Mary Gonzalez, Jill Graham, Margie Jaquette Flournoy, Donald Clark, Sherry Ebeler, Juan Garza, Doug McLean, Eddie Parker, D. Painter, Christopher Corzelius, Judy Amos, Norma Waters, Alan Bratton, Malcolm Cooper, Art Shepard, Tom Jordan, Susan Clevenger, Joe Presnitz, Bill Brown, Judy Bray, Todd Bland, Jack Partain, Mike McElroy, Jenny Porter Scott, George Pierce, Mary Blackwell, Norbert Avibo, Faye Mullins, Barbara Class, Christopher Crossan, Tim Lowry, Jean Baker, Laura Bryce, Clark Perkins, Roy Billings, Dorothy Mullins, Marvin Womack, Debbie Lackey, Kevin McGee, Joseph Goldberger, Ali B. Lonsberry, Vassar W. Mills, By your grace, may we, like them, be made perfect in your love. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage, we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. song of
the saints of God, patient and brave and true. Toiled and fought and lived and died for the Lord they loved and knew. One was a doctor and one was a queen. One was a shepherdess on the green. They were all of them saints of God. And I mean God helping to be one too. Love their Lord so dear, so dear. His love made them strong. Follow the right for Jesus, save the whole good lives long. One was a soldier and one was a priest. One was slain by fierce wild beast, and there's not any reason, no, not the least, why I shouldn't. Not only in ages past, there are hundreds of thousands still. The world is bright with the joyous saints who love to do Jesus' will. You can meet them in school or in lanes or at sea, in church or in train or in shops or at tea for the saints of God are just folk like me and I need to be one too and now as our Savior Christ has taught us we are bold to say our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us for our All Saints Sunday service. Immediately following this will be our coffee hour conversation. As you know, through the season of stewardship and prayer, we are focusing on our four primary institutions, which comprise Good Shepherd. Uh, This particular conversation will focus on the hill. I'll be joined by the Reverend Dr. Traywin Malone and Sam Hensley for that conversation. It was spirited. And I love how it focused on really getting beyond our walls and the spirit of sharing our faith uh, with others. So I hope you'll join us for that. We'd love to hear your thoughts back from it. Also, later today is our 6 o'clock in-person service. There is a link you can click if you would still like to join us. That is a Eucharist uh, if you would like to join us for that. We'd love to see you there. It will be in our parking lot on the Windsor campus. Also want you to make, make you aware that um, next Sunday, November the 8th, we will have a stewardship parade. We are encouraging everyone to come by who has submitted their pledge card or would like to turn it in then. Um, We'd like to honor that and personally thank you for your financial support of our mission. In addition, that morning we will be blessing uh, candles. And each one of you will receive a blessed candle. So a little bit of the church will be in your home. And we'd like to share that with you. You can also sign up for a meal from Chef Robert, um, as well as to hear the Holy Ghost Supreme. So we love these parades. Hope you'll make it a point to put it in your calendar, and I'd love to personally see you there. So that is next Sunday from 1230 to 130 right here on the Windsor campus. Also, Monday, November the 2nd at 6 p.m. is our All Souls Evensong. Uh, We'll have music by Russell Schultz. Uh, He was a former music director here. Many of you are familiar with that. And as you know, we have this tradition of gathering at the end of the day in song and in prayer uh, to give thanks to God. So that's 6 p.m., November the 2nd, All Souls Evensong. Uh, And finally, 
we do want to thank you for your ongoing financial support. You'll see links uh, just below this video that you can click either to make a donation to Good Shepherd or El Buen Samaritano, a diocesan mission of our, of our uh, diocese. Um, in addition, just want to thank you for being a blessing to us as we give thanks to God through our offerings of all the blessings we've received from God. May God give you grace to follow his saints in faith, hope, and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this coffee hour. As you know, during the season of stewardship and prayer, we are focusing on our four institutions which comprise Good Shepherd and our mission and ministry. And today we are focusing on the Hill. And I am joined by the Reverend Dr. Uh, Trewin Malone, uh, who is the interim vicar here, and Sam Hensley, who is the director for music and mission? Yes, sir. All right. And so two staff members, and we're going to have a conversation about this ambitious effort that was going on here and all the life that we find from it. And so look forward to having you uh, join us for this conversation. So uh, as you both know, uh, when we start something uh, new, um, it has sort of this idea of concept to um, implementation. Um, as you first learned about this 
effort. What drew you to it? Uh, and you came in a little bit after the story, but I, I mean, <laughs> still an interesting story saying, hey, I wanna, I wanna go ahead and be a part of this. So right. Sam, why don't you start? What, like, what, what was it about the Hill that? Well, uh, I've known Kathy Pfister, who was the first vicar here since uh, the 1990s. We did a lot of youth ministry together in North Carolina. And um, Kathy uh, was the one who was uh, tapped to be the vicar of the Hill. And so when that was determined, she gave me a call when I was living in Virginia. And she said, you know, Sam, are you interested in coming to Austin to help with this opportunity of creating this new community? It's going to be one based around uh, uh, community work, community organizing and evangelism and uh, looking for you to do some community building, but also be the director of music. And uh, I love Kathy. I said, absolutely. I would love to come down and do that. And um, and so uh, that was in May of uh, 2015 that we packed up and moved down from uh, Roanoke, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we started uh, our first day here of uh, building this place was September 1st, 2015. And here we are now in uh, October of uh, 2020 and extremely proud of the work that we've done and the connections we've made and uh, the light that we've shown in this neighborhood. Awesome. Trey, what about you? What, when you, when you thought about the Hill and this opportunity to come in, um, right after Kathy and build on her legacy and leadership. What, what attracted you to, to the Hill? What attracted me was I, I heard Kathy give a presentation uh, at a vestry retreat, a vestry conference uh, put on by the diocese and she came and she talked about starting the Hill and starting what was going on. And it, right then I was intrigued with what was going on at this, uh, at this location and the, the creative energy that was around what I heard uh, from Kathy. So I was intrigued with it for from way back. Uh, and if I ever had a Sunday off, <laughs> I, would, I would come and worship here. So I worshiped here probably about six times before uh, I came here to be the interim vicar. Um, what intrigues me about, still intrigues me about it is the possibilities that we have for ministry. The, the creative energy that's here. Uh, even though we're not meeting in person, I can still feel that creative energy. I can still experience it. Um, and when we, if we ever start to meet in person again, uh, when we start to meet in person again, I know that energy is going to just explode and that, that uh, the creativity will also uh, explode and be, be part of who we are. Great. Sam, is there a story you want to share from the beginning? Like, at least for you. I know you can't speak for the entire community, but for you, like, this was an important experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first things we did uh, was we talked about, you know, we don't have a congregation <clears throat> yet. We don't have infrastructure. We don't have plates <laughs> or, or, or bowls. So how can we... Uh, but we can do ministry. We can do ministry without those things. And so how do we do that? And so one of the first things we ever did was an event called Souptober. And that was, uh, that was in October after we had opened in September. And what we did is we invited the community to come and have soup. And we said, bring your own bowl, BYOB. Uh, we'll provide the soup, you provide a bowl, and we will build something together. And uh, really it was just a chance for us to get to know people who were coming. And we did that three, uh, three weeks in a row, maybe three or four weeks in a row. This room was filled with people. We had some live music, just the beginnings of what, what, was, to, uh, what was to become uh, good energy in this place. And I'll use that word a lot, good energy, because that's what, that's what is here. And that's what um, the people who come here experience, I think. And, and, and every Sunday is what, what draws people here, as they say, it just, it just feels really good. And so it was just that, um, it was just that sense of creativity also that we, we don't have bowls, uh, but we don't need to rent bowls. We're just going to ask people to bring bowls. Yeah. Um, that, that, that creativity was, is a hallmark of the Hill and how we engage in ministry. You know, some people say if, in terms of incorporating visitors into your community, um, if everything is set up perfectly, uh, you're kind of uh, leaving them out of the barn raising experience There's and so a lot of truth you, to that you know here you were it's like we don't have bowls bring, <laughs> yep. your, own bowl. bring your own bowl now right. you're actually part mm -hmm. of what's happening yeah. here exactly. i mean without having to fill out a card or you know whatever it was you mm -hmm. know it, it happened relationally yeah uh that's awesome 
Um, Trewin, as you have uh, been here, if you, as, and, and I recognize it's under very different circumstances, but some of that same DNA that, uh, that Sam's talking about, um, have you seen that? What, what have been some, some moments for you when you've seen kind of the souptober? I mean, what a, what a crazy, <laughs> wonderful uh, right. idea. You well, know? what I've seen is, is people, uh, what, what's happening is things bubble up. Um, it's the creativity uh, is just, just bubbles up from, from the bottom. Uh, and I've, I've seen that and I've experienced that. So when we have our Wednesday morning Zoom uh, coffee hour, there's always something creative that somebody suggests. And sometimes we have to say, mm, maybe not, but <laughs> so is, uh, is in all, co all congregations and all ministry. But what I've heard uh, is uh, that creativity from the bottom up, and we hear ideas all the time. And some, sometimes we say, that is a great idea. Let's implement that. Let's see if we can do that. Um, our night prayers is one of the, is one of the things that, that has happened. That really came out of the uh, Wednesday morning Zoom coffee hour. Mm -hmm. It didn't come from us. Well, we implemented it, but uh, it, it didn't come from us. It was that idea that of, of we really think we need this. We really think we want this. So let's see if we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the, the DNA that I, that I get from here is that let's put it out. Let's see if we can do it. Let's take a chance. And I always say, let's fail forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's do that. So I think that's part of the DNA of who we are here. Well, and that's come to both of your stories, right? The idea of let's try something. But I love the, the, the names for it. I mean, Souptober. I mean, I assume that that's a new thing for church, right? <laughs> it, it was uh, not something we'd ever heard of. <laughs> that's fabulous. What other, what other words would you use to describe the hill, just in terms of this worshiping community that come to mind? Fail forward, try anything, kind of the creative community spirit. What? Well, the one thing that really comes to mind is, uh, is care. One of the things that I have really uh, enjoyed seeing is just the care that the parishioners feel for each other especially during this pandemic, mm -hmm. is that they have been reaching out to one another. And, um, and really, isn't that the essence of church, is where we care about one another? It's not just the leadership checking in with, uh, with everybody, but it's everybody checking in with everybody else. And, um, and certainly, that part is, a, is an extremely um, uplifting piece of the hill for me. And I mean, and, and it's nice because we do have a smaller community. People did get a chance to uh, get to know each other uh, before the pandemic, and they were able to establish those connections, uh, smaller connections, and now um, and now they're checking in on each other. And if there's a problem, they're letting us know, mm -hmm. and we're able to uh, respond appropriately. So that care um, is is incredibly special. Mm. Trevor, would you add any other? I can add when I when I visited here for worship, um, there was a, there was a sense of purpose and intentionality about the, the worship that was going on here. And at the same time, it was a kind of intimate worship that, uh, that, we've, that I experienced that I, was, I felt a part of it right away. Uh, and I think that that's, that's part of who we are and what, we, what we're doing here. But I, and I really want to emphasize that there was an intentionality. It wasn't sloppy yeah. worship. It wasn't sloppy liturgy. But it, there was an intentionality that Everyone knew what they were doing, and everyone could participate. Um, I would I would walk in, and more than one person would walk up to me and say, "Hi, how you doing? What are you doing here?" <laughs> really, not what are you doing here, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, how are you? And uh, I am so and so. Um, and I know that happens in other congregations. It, it happens at Windsor, where there's where there's really greeting, great greeting. Um, but I, I noticed that the essence of, of the hill was the caring, as, as Sam said. We care. Mm -hmm. They care. We all care. Mm -hmm. I, I felt cared for when I walked in to worship. Well, and that gets to the, the vision for Good Shepherd, which is fully known and fully loved, that mm -hmm. tailing, you know, those two, two um, four words at the end of our vision statement. It's, I mean, so what a way to experience that. Um, and you, you all are describing that incredibly well. Yeah, and, 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 it, and it even is outside of, it's, it's in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the whole idea of that anything that we do on this campus, whether or not it's Sunday morning church, whether or not it's uh, a concert, whether it's uh, the second Saturday yard sale, 
that, um, that we're, going to, uh, we're going to express our faith through the love that we share and the care that we share with the people there. Um, and that's not just reserved for Sunday mornings. That's, that's a Monday through Sunday. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's what we've seen um, time and time again from the parishioners here. And, um, and it's just, it, it, it makes me excited to work in such a place that, that that's the essence. Mm-hmm. Right. And I would, I would imagine, I'd check this out with the two of you, but because it is a relatively new community, you know, you continue to go back to the basics over and over again. Like, what's our basic intention? What are we trying to do here? Versus it getting, um, uh, I don't know, muddled with what has happened in the past. You know, there's, there's freshness here, but we want to make sure we do this caring. We're, you know, sharing the faith. Mm-hmm. It's about good worship engagement, you know, getting to know the wider community and so on, mm-hmm. um, and just continue to return to those fundamentals yeah. for, over and over again, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, um, and, and we do, and we look back and we say, you know, did this, did this help us in, in what we're trying to do in, in furthering our mission, and, and does it need to be tweaked, or, um, you, know, do, or, you know, or has it run its season, mm-hmm. you know, um, do, is this something we need to continue to to do or do we need to think about responding in new ways mm-hmm. and that, that was always on always on my mind to uh, think about those you know that 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 piece and, and definitely there are some things we tried and it just didn't work yeah <laughs> you just you throw spaghetti at the wall and you see what sticks and and i and i'm i'm happy to say that i feel like more spaghetti is stuck than not and, yeah uh, but you know when we when we come back together and are able to gather in person this there's just going to be more spaghetti to throw and that's pretty, that's exciting. It, it is. And the church doesn't have much, uh, I mean, church in big picture, um, places where they can do R&D, you know, mm-hmm. um, and yet with a creative venture like this, you really can. Mm-hmm. And there's a freshness about that. And I mean, so many high, high tech companies have allotted a certain amount of time for just dreaming and you know here's a place that we dream all over the place but here's a place where you continually uh be able to connect with our dreams and mm-hmm. what we'd like to do yeah. um what was it about that your backgrounds that like you know said this is what i want to do I, like um I, I feel like i'm connecting to this ministry this opportunity this invitation was there anything about your or or maybe you just came in i have no idea what i'm doing and that's that maybe the best <laughs> set of fresh eyes, you know, other than I, I love Jesus and I love, mm-hmm. I love, uh, I love this parish. So, but what was it? Was there, was there a part of your background that said, yeah, this is, well, you know, for me, it, it, it's almost like this job was custom tailored. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, I, I've been playing music in the Episcopal church for well over 20 years. I traveled and played for middle and high school retreats. I've played for various congregations. And so the, to be the director of music, uh, was was just right in my wheelhouse. Now, being the director of music, playing the guitar is not necessarily the most normal thing in the Episcopal Church. But that was the great thing about the Hill. It's not necessarily the most normal place. Yeah. So, um, but because I, I was very well studied in the hymnody, grew up with the hymnody, love the 1982 hymnal, love lift every voice and sing, but also can do uh, my own compositions and things like that. So the music, that so it, that part was just sort of a like, oh yeah, that that totally works. But and the the, the mission piece. The way that I have wanted to live out my Christian vocation has been through service and through uh, connection with with people um, outside of uh, Sunday mornings. And so I've done that. Um, I, I really came to an idea of of, uh, of, of outreach uh, when I was in high school, when I was in youth group, and going my youth group leader giving us opportunities to visit soup kitchens mm-hmm. and to have speakers come in and talk about poverty and talk about. Um, marginalized uh, populations, and and so I, I sort of garnered my faith in in, in serving others uh, during that, and so the the fact that um, that I could seek out ways to do that um, as a full time job was sort of like wow, to do music and that I mean those are the two things I do. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so it was just a, it just felt like a real natural fit. Yeah. That is great. Yeah. Perfect. Sure. Yeah, I was one of the three canons for, uh, we didn't call them canons for congregational development, but I was one of the three canons in the Diocese of North Carolina uh, called regional uh, canons, canon for regional ministry. And that changed a lot in, in terms of the title. Regional priest, canon for regional ministry. Um, 
And what I love to do is to go in congreg into congregations and look at the possibilities of what, what can happen if we do intentional work, if we can work on something that, uh, looking at a vision, looking at what the vision is. And as you said, we, we build upon the past when I, when I go into do visioning, so what really works in the past? So what are your strengths? What are your core values? And how can, you, how can we build on those core values and those strengths? And then look at something brand new and say, this fits with our vision, this fits with who we are, this fits with, uh, with, our, with our, our goals. Um, but I'll go back, I don't, I'll go back. I was a, a priest at a, at a large congregation and I was the priest for youth ministry at that point and also the chaplain of the school. Um, so we had about a um, hundred potential teens in the youth group, uh, and usually about 50 to well, for 20, 30 to 50 showed up on at every event mm -hmm. on Sunday. Um, and I loved working with the possibilities with teens. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're messy, they're, they're funny, they're, they're, yeah. they're emotional, uh, but I love doing that. And, and what we did in that, in that youth group is that we had a, a, a vestry for the youth group. Uh, this, it was with adults and teens. Um, they got the budget every, every month. That was the teen budget, the youth ministry budget. They would go over the budget. What, what does it look like? Where are we going? Do, are we spending what we need to spend? And so there was some leadership development too, and I think that was important to me. Uh, there was a missional, uh, context a component of that uh, youth group as well. We always looked at how can we get out in the community and serve. Mm -hmm. um, so we, that, that component, both of those components were really important to me of leadership and ser service. Um, and it wasn't me. As a result, a lot of those teens, when they grew up, they're, they're now uh, Gen Xers. I won't. <laughs> so a lot of the teens became uh, members of vestries. They became, uh, became, were on search committees. Um, they became attorneys, therapists. Uh, and, and most, what I, what I see, the, the people I keep in contact with are in serving uh, mm -hmm. ministries. Uh, an attorney can be a service ministry and, and a therapist and uh, teachers and professors. There are a couple of professors. So that they're really, they, they learn how to serve mm -hmm. and they're still learning how to serve. Um, and I don't want to take up too much airtime, but I, uh, there was another, when I was in a, working with a congregation in North Carolina, there was a, a rough time where uh, they had to, they had a disillusion of a, a pastoral relationship. Mm -hmm. So they, the, the pastoral relationship uh, came apart and the, the priest left. And the new rector came in and, and uh, as a member of the diocese, uh, we did a two day asset mapping uh, group with them, uh, a workshop, two-day asset mapping. He said, what is going, what is working? What is working? What are the strengths that you have and what are the resources that you have mm -hmm. already? And after those two days, they came up with some great ministries about how to, how to serve the community. They didn't have to spend a dime mm -hmm. because they said, we have these strengths and we have these assets that we're going to uh, use. And I kind of see that, that's what excites me about this place. What excites me about the Hill is that there are a lot of assets and a lot of strengths. And um, to, to look at the vision and see where we're gonna go. Yeah, I, I connect to what you're talking about assets. We always, I mean, you know, just with, uh, with the spirit in our heart is, is an, I mean, that's, that's the asset, right? I mean. You don't have to go much beyond that. And I'm, I'm reminded of a story that Walter Brueggemann, who has written a lot um, about the Old Testament, he tells about it was a diocese in Canada. There was a horrible lawsuit, and the diocese ended up going bankrupt, according to him. So the bishop gathered all the priests together and said, and shared the, the news of where they were. Um, and he said, you know, I just want to let you know that um, all we really need uh, is we need a table and a basin and we're in business. Mm. And then he began to wash their feet. And not a single priest left that diocese. They all 
rolled up their sleeves and just got busy. And so, you know, in, in efforts like this, we recognize um, it really is simple. Uh, and yet when you stay, stick to the basic building blocks and reconnect to care, as you were saying, you know, the passion in our heart, how faith is rubbed off, um, that's, what, that's what grows, grows things. A couple of dis, my own, from my own story to share with efforts that, this effort that's going on here. Um, we, in terms of a program that didn't work out, we tried something called Impact, which was a contemporary worship service and had great band. I mean, there was no fault of the music that it didn't work out. We tried for a, a year and, you know, we had peak of maybe 78 people and then it waned down to about 22. <clears throat> And if you took away the band and those who had to be there, it was probably about 12. And we recognized the resources we're putting this towards this aren't, aren't really working out. So we went to our youth and we said, so it just curious as to youth and young adults, you know, why, why this service didn't speak to you? And they said, well, um, we come for the liturgy. The formal liturgy is what they wanted. Now, if we had asked that question early on, we would have saved ourselves a lot of, a lot of hassle. Uh, but we tried it, and we tried it, and there was a lot of effort there, and that was good. It was good to do that. It was good for the church to do that. Um, regardless, really, of the outcome, it really was, let's get behind a new idea and really uh, see it all the way through. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for, for that. Um, I was thinking about the, the hard spot in doing this and didn't know if you had a story or so to share about this can be hard work. You know, like any ministry can be hard work. Um, is there a moment or how do you uh, work with yourself when things get hard and, and doing this? And, and what's that moment look like? You know, it's what I have come to uh, realize is that, you know, there's going to be hard moments in any, any vocation, any ministry. Um, and it's easy for me to get bogged down in those things. Um, but the reality is that the, the blessings outweigh the hard. And that doesn't make the hard any less, but it does allow me to work through, the, work through it um, in a more healthy way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly there were, um, there were a lot of, there, were, there have been disappointments when you put a lot of work into something and then people don't, um, don't respond to it the way you think they're going to. And, mm -hmm. and certainly we've had events like that. We've had concerts where we thought it was just going to be incredible and there were we were going to really pull together diverse groups of people and it just it just fell flat and the, i mean the music was good but the response just wasn't there and um and it's easy to get discouraged and say oh you know should we continue to do this but it's also that we say well wait a second this this yes this was a tough this was a tough day but we've also had these other days where um, where we have seen great success and however you want to define success and we've seen it we've seen engagement in ways that um, that we couldn't have ever imagined and so um, and so you just have to continue to keep those things in mind and know that that this is not this isn't a switch that's going to get flipped on and all of a sudden you know everything's going to happen like building things like this and, and building relationships it takes time and you're going to go through ups and downs mm -hmm. and you just have to journey through those ups and downs and know that God is with you and know that, um, you, that this work is not in vain and continue to hold it in prayer and, and just pray for leading and guiding and, and, um, and know that it's not always going to be incredibly, you know, huge, you know, monstrous response, but, but every time you do it, you do it with great love and you plant seeds and know that time is gonna, uh, is gonna grow the crops from those seeds. Mm -hmm. No. There's always, as, as Sam says, there's always rough times in ministry. There's always down times in ministry. Um, and how I, how I take care of myself is by going deeper into my own spirituality. Uh, where is God leading me? What is God doing in this, in this, in this place at this time? Um, so that, there's two components to this. I go deeper spir spiritually. And 
keep in touch, connected with people relationally. Yeah. Uh, so if, if I'm having a conflict with someone, I'm, I'm reaching out to that person and saying, can we talk? What's the relationship like? Let's not break this relationship. Let's, uh, I don't, I'm not perfect at it <laughs> by any means, but uh, we, as I go deeper spiritually, I can see where God is leading me in that relationship and how that relationship can, can work. That gets me through the rough times. Mm -hmm. That gets me through the times that I think I'm failing or that think that the church is failing or think that, uh, that someone else is failing. So I, I really do try to keep connected uh, with people with whom I have conflict or with people who, who uh, are just uh, having a rough time themselves. And yeah, that connection can be, just gives you that assurance that at least we're community going through this, mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. It's not an isolating piece. Mm -hmm. You can draw strength from each other. Yeah. So I was thinking about a, a time early in my ministry. I was a, been a rector of a place, was really passionate about it growing. It wasn't growing as fast as I wanted it to. Uh, and so I said to myself, well, if you really um, are serious about this, just take responsibility for the growth that you want to have happen. So I said, well, what would that look like? Well, maybe I should go out to the kind of parks and just begin to talk to people about the parish was Transfiguration and, you know, maybe get their ideas. Now, I, I went out by myself. I probably wouldn't do that today in today's <laughs> current context. I probably would go out with a couple other people. Uh, but my, my deal with myself was um, if, I, if I were uh, was wearing shorts, to, to work, I had to go to the parks uh, and just start to talk to families that were there. And so um, I had my, my own sort of uh, question about this as I would walk up and I would say, uh, you know, I'm a young pastor, didn't want to say priest, young pastor in the area and uh, looking to grow our parish and uh, do some more things for families and just wondering um, if you had any ideas and based on your own needs or experiences. And then they would say, well, what do you have going on? So I could tell them everything we did. Uh, that would, might create interest, but I could also learn something. Like they may have an idea that we're not considering right now. And so um, I, I probably did this for, I don't know, a uh, month and a half or so, uh, going out once a week to, to do this. And the first family that I approached, um, came back with her and I said, you know, I'm a young pastor. I just want to know, do you have any ideas for me? That she said, well, I'm Jewish. I said, well, it doesn't matter. It's, what do you like to do? What, what works for your family? Uh, that year, you know, we were a small parish. We had an average Sunday attendance of about 125. We grew by over 70 people that year. And I think what, what happened, and only, only a few came through that effort, but what happened was, uh, the, me as a leader, I was put in the mindset of growth and that affected the whole congregation. We all were sort of put in this mindset of growth. And I think that mindset of growing versus a fixed mindset, that's gonna be the comparison there, is really helpful. Um, and I see such that growth mindset here at the Hill. You know, it's about, we're just gonna try. We are, mm -hmm. we are, we are applying ourselves because we believe so strongly in this work. Um, and sometimes that mindset alone uh, seems to generate uh, new people coming through the yeah. door. So well, and I think that I think it's one of those things where evangelism and growth go hand in hand. Whereas uh, you know what we do is that we um, we we show God's love in everything that we do. Um, we have the ability to um, to reach into this neighborhood and engage in a, in a deeper way and to share God's love. And because we're sharing God's love, they're going to get a sense of who we are. And they might not be, people that we engage with might not be at a place in their spiritual journey where they're looking for a faith community. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that if we show God's love at every time, even if they don't come, but, we, but we're evangelizing with our actions. Mm -hmm. St. Francis said, you know, preach the gospel at all times. If, if necessary, use words. But what we do is that we, um, if, if we're going to uh, do after-school ministry at a local apartment complex, we're going to do those things with great love. And so that's going to give people a sense of who we are. It's not just, you know, they might forget what we say, but they're going to remember that we were there every week mm -hmm. and that we showed love to those kids and that we were there to tutor and we were there to play games and we're there to build those relationships. And so um, if they come to a place in their spiritual journey where they're looking for a faith community, then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, I remember what Good Shepherd on the Hill is like. 
And that's a place that I want to go because they're because I feel warm there. I feel I feel loved there. They love my kids. I, I want to be I want to be somewhere where that's what's happening. And we saw we've seen that um, with our second Saturday sales and, and one of our parishioners, Lisa McMinn, came to us through that. She came, was uh, introduced to Kathy and myself. She was just selling. She wasn't a member of the parish, but then she was looking for something. She knew what we were about. I mean, we evangelized through what we were doing. Mm -hmm. and, and then all of a sudden, there she is. And then she's all of a sudden the co-chair of the search committee that brings you here. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know we, we evangelize in the idea that it's like we want to grow because we want people to come here because of what they feel. They feel God's love through our actions. Mm. That is great. Yeah. Um, this uh, idea of reaching out into the community, um, going beyond our walls, is certainly something that's current in church work. And, and you probably come across that a lot in your own encouragement of other, other congregations. Exactly. Um, yeah. I th what I see is uh, who, who's, at, who's not at the table? This mm -hmm. is what I'm always asking is who's not at the table, and then who's, who's our neighbor who's not at the table. Um, and so I encourage people to, say, to think about that, who's not at the table, and what would the table look like if we, if we brought people to this table. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think that we, we, we look at average Sunday attendance as a metric, but I also think that uh, engagement is a, is a, is a metric that mm -hmm. we, we can look at. Um, Give me an example of my former congregation. We, and I got a call this morning uh, from my former congregation from a share. We set up a room that, um, what I noticed is that in the parking lot, the sheriff's deputies used uh, that parking lot as a transition when they were going from shift to shift. So they used that. They, they actually, uh, they were, they called it something. I can't remember what they called it. The Holy Hill, I think, but <laughs> something like what we have. Um, so, so we noticed that, and we went out and, and talked to the sheriff's deputies and said, would you like a place where you can come inside and stay warm and have air conditioning when it's hot and do your reports? Um, and they said, that would be wonderful. So we set up a, a, a key a code for them to come into the, into the room. Uh, parishioners provided snacks and coffee and uh, we put a, a icon of St. Michael's. It was a St. Michael's chapel. Mm. Uh, we had soft drinks, a refrigerator, microwave, and so what. What happened is, that if even if the if the, even if they didn't come to church, even if they didn't come to worship, uh, we had a group of people who were watching out for us all the time. Yes, <laughs> they said this is important. We're going to watch out for you, and we learned so much from, about the community. I would talk to the sheriffs and say, Who, who's in need? Yeah. Where do you see need? And what, what's going on in the community? So we really learned with that, in that relationship. Um, and so that was engagement. We've, I see the opportunity for engagement in this, in this congregation, uh, engaging in the community, engaging in where the needs are. Um, even if people don't come to worship, mm -hmm. although I really want people to come to worship. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that kind of engagement. Tell us about the community. Uh, this community is extremely diverse socioeconomically and, um, and racially. And um, it is very interesting because, you know, just right around the hill, you've got, you know, you've got uh, properties that are very, very expensive, but then you go just to the east of us, less than a quarter mile, and you have very, uh, you have subsidized housing. Mm -hmm. You have um, Section Eight apartments, and so you know the challenge is to see how we can bring all of those people together. I mean, then that's how you build beloved community: is you bring people uh, from all different walks of life to together, and you help understanding and uh, communication, and you build you build something to where everyone is caring about one another. And I mean, that might kind of sound like a pipe dream, but I really think that that's our, that's our mission is to, um, is to create a container uh, that where anybody can come and that anyone can experience God's love uh, through, the, through their connection with other people. So, um, so you know, we've got a, just an extremely um, challenging thing to do that with, with, with uh, it being so, uh, so socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomically diverse, and, mm -hmm. and um, but we we do our best, and and we we don't uh, 
we don't turn people away and we, we, we try to say we welcome all and you come as you are. You know, there is no, um, there is no expectation of how you should be or what you should look like or how you should dress or, or how you should speak. You know, we, we try to say that everyone is welcome here and, um, and our parishioners do an incredible job of, of welcoming in that way. Um, so it's, it's a great neighborhood, a lot of great neighbors, uh, a lot more great neighbors to get to know. Mm -hmm. I think that hospitality is so important mm -hmm. and such a, a need. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we are greeted, recognized uh, by a stranger, there's something to that. I yeah. mean, and there's biblical stories, St. Francis <laughs> stories. I mean, it goes on from there. I mean, it just, it is what we are about. And so mm -hmm. uh, that first touch of being a welcoming presence, I think communicates an awful mm -hmm. lot. And I think, you know, during a time of crisis, this may be where this, this may be their parish. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole idea about in congregational development, those who are outside that you never see who actually consider this their parish. And it's in a time of crisis that you'll see them. Uh, family uh, illness happens or something like that, they'll show up um, because it's, they, they have felt that welcoming and attachment to this place. Yeah, and one of the things that I've, I've been really proud of is that we have a reputation in this neighborhood. I mean, we are church on the hill. Mm -hmm. We have the love sign outside. People, people use that as a beacon. They, that we've heard numerous stories about people just turning that corner and seeing that and feeling feeling that love. And w so whether or not they come or not, they know, they know that we're a good place. They know we're a, a beacon of light. Mm -hmm. And that comes from everything that we do. And, uh, and I'm really heartened by that because we want to be that. I mean, not just, uh, I mean, we are, we are sort of the parish in this area, um, but we're also uh, just a, a, an active part of the community. And, and to me, that's an incredible part of faith is being an active part of the community that you're in. Mm -hmm. And it takes knowing the community uh, right. for, for us to, to, walk the, to walk the community and see what's out there. I would, I would encourage anyone to, when they come over here to leadership, to come over here to, say, to walk, the, walk the community. Um, maybe even drive the community, probably not walk at all because it's, it's a huge Hilly. community. Yeah. Um, to, to get in your car and, just, and look at it and see what's going on. Um, I, I, I think Jesus was smart, <laughs> probably so. Mm. Uh, when, when Jesus traveled so much with his disciples and, and his uh, showing them who's here, who's in, the, who's, in, who's in these regions, what are the needs, who's, uh, who needs healing. Um, so I think that that's the, one of the things that we can do is encourage leadership to look at who's in the, in the neighborhood and to start to uh, engage mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. I read something recently that said, uh, those who dream at night do so in vanity, and those who live out their dreams during the day are heroes. Wow, that's great, that's great. And, and so I think of you two as, as doing just that, which is it's one thing when you're going to bed at night saying, boy, I would love, and whatever the program idea is, and you can imagine it all the way to the end, uh, but those who, who show up during the day and live this out each and every day, that's where the heroic effort is. And we, got, so. we have lots of dreams. COVID, COVID can't stop the dreaming. It may put it off for a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, God's work is long, mm -hmm. it's, and, it is, and it's ongoing, and it's gonna continue to be ongoing. And, uh, and so even in the midst of of this pandemic when we can't gather in groups, the dreaming is happening and there's new dreaming that's happening and new opportunities. And um, so, I mean, we've only been here five years and we were just getting started. We have, we have, we have a lot of uh, exciting work to do in God's name. Is there any last story that comes to mind that you would love to share with uh, the wider Good Shepherd community that hasn't been shared already? There's so many, there's so many stories. Um, I can't, I can't just pull one, but um, I just think that uh, one of the, the, the most exciting things is uh, that we continue to do when it comes to community engagement plus engagement with Windsor is our uh, Music on the Hill concert series. Mm. And just seeing the, the, the incredible energy that happens in this room 
when you get a funk band in here, or when you get uh, the 25-piece the Hispanic Caribbean ensemble in here, or the Steel Pan Orchestra in here, or the Peterson Brothers playing blues. Um, just the, the, what happens in this space, what is created, even if you don't talk to people, the energy and, uh, and the camaraderie that, uh, that is shared, I mean, that's, that to me is the essence of, I've said it before, I'll say it again, of just building, uh, building the beloved community of people from every race and every nation to come together and love one another purely and truly in God's name because God has you know, created all of us to, to be love to one another. And, um, and just, I get so excited to see people in the back dancing <laughs> and people, like people you would never imagine to see dancing just back there doing it and to see uh, just the, the wide array of people that are coming. Um, it, it, it just is, um, it, it's what I hope heaven will be. Yeah. A big, a big, uh, a big concert uh, with, with everybody <laughs> smiling and having a good time. Well, you know, I've been thinking about this all along. It's this uh, colleague of mine a long time ago stood up during a sermon and just said, you know, he said this to the community. He's like, just take a look around because this is the kingdom of God. And uh, we all have to work this out because we're going to be living for <laughs> with each other for eternity. <laughs> you know, you think about all the social issues going on today, yeah. like we got to work this out. Like, right. it's not like there are going to be sections there. Yeah. So when you have a wonderful moment when just community comes together and there's music that everyone's participating in, dancing, worship, uh, some kind of vulnerability or authenticity that you see and a good mm -hmm. time, I mean, a joy, mm -hmm. That is, that's super special, yeah. for sure, yeah. Two weeks ago was the first time that I'd done anything live here at all. So, I mean, it's all been virtual, it's all been Zoom, it's, uh, and getting to know people over the phone and over Zoom. And uh, so when we celebrated Eucharist here a couple of weeks ago, um, I noticed something, and I, I could tell, I could tell it when people were on Zoom, the, the kind of, um, sacramental presence that people had, mm. in, uh, even in Zoom, on Zoom. Uh, but then I noticed it when we when we were when we had Eucharist, how people love everything here, and all the objects that are sacred, and all the objects uh, that uh, moving the altar mm -hmm. was such a sacred uh, move, mm. was such a sacred um, event, uh, and the care that people took. You know that that kind of love and that kind of sacramental uh, presence that I uh, that I saw that I saw on Zoom and that I saw here, um, taking nothing for granted. Uh, that's that's what I loved. Mm -hmm. I think that's a story that I can tell over and over and over again. Um, yeah. And they showed you how valuable those things were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to celebrate and congratulate um, both of you and everyone else who's been a part of this effort and uh, just recognize that um, it is in many ways that growing leading edge for all of Good Shepherd. I um, mean, obviously we're all in ministry together, but because of the freshness of this, it has a unique position in terms of our own understanding of ministry in this particular uh, moment in this, in this cultural context. Um, and so I'm grateful for everybody who's made this happen and it has a very promising future for sure. Uh, and look forward to seeing that myself. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank so you. next week we'll have the other half of this site, right? Uh, Hillside Early Childhood Center. And um, we're gonna be seeing a little bit more about that program as we continue this four week journey through our four institutions for Good Shepherd. So thanks for joining us for Coffee Hour. Thank you so much for being a part of this valuable community. And we look forward to seeing you next week.